Hey boaters, it's Jim McGowan from Ray Marine, and this is Ray Marine Live. Thank you for joining us tonight here on YouTube and Facebook. Tonight we're going to be talking all about networking Ray Marine products. We're going to just kind of pause here for a moment, let a few people join the room, join the broadcast. I see we got some viewers coming online. Tonight we'll be talking about CTOK NG networking. We'll be talking about our Raynet, Ethernet, high speed networking. We'll cover some Bluetooth, some Wi Fi, and all the other different protocols that you'll find on Raymarine products. Again, thank you for joining us tonight. Really glad that you could take some time out of your Thursday to learn all about networking your Raymarine products. Now, here on YouTube and Facebook, we can take comments as well. So if you have questions along the way, feel free to post them, uh, post them up through your social media channels. Uh, we'll take some of them live here on the air, and anything that we don't get to live, uh, we will come back in and address your comments um, uh, back in, in uh, on the respective uh, platforms, Facebook and YouTube. Uh, but certainly feel free to chat in comments. We'd love to hear uh, what you like. Uh, also, tell us what you'd like to hear in the future. Uh, this is going to be an ongoing broadcast series, so we'd really like to hear your feedback. Uh, give us some ideas and thoughts on what you would like to see. Looks like we've got a pretty good audience, so we'll get started here. So tonight we're talking networking Raymarine products. So we know uh, it's spring season here in uh, North America. A lot of boats are hitting the water again. People are thinking about adding electronics all across the North and the Northeast and the Northwest. And one of the things that is sometimes a little bit mysterious is how all these products actually tie together. What's going on in the back end inside your helm uh, that makes your MFD talk to your radar, or makes your fish finder talk uh, to your MFD. Um, it's actually not as mysterious as you'd think, and we're going to unravel some of those mysteries tonight. So the first topic we're going to talk about is CTOK NG networking. And I have a selection of CTOK NG cables and connectors here on the workbench, and we'll take a look at some of the common ones. Uh, but first, let me bring up just a real simple CTOK NG network diagram um, so you can see how one of these networks goes together. So CTOK NG is a CAN bus network, and it consists of two main parts. There is a backbone, and in this drawing, the backbone is color-coded blue. There is also uh, the notion of spurs, and spurs are what the devices actually tie in with, and those are color-coded in white. And your spurs are things like your instruments, uh, your MFDs, uh, your compass sensor for your autopilot, uh, and other components like that, transducers. Um, all tie in with spurs into the basic CTOK NG network. Um, so I'm going to show you here some of the basic network components. Um, so I'm going to start actually with a backbone cable. So you can see this is just a short little one meter piece of backbone cable. But one of the things that's really cool about CTOK NG is everything is color coded and everything is keyed uniquely. Um, so it's blue. Blue is always backbone. Um, it has a keying system that only allows it to plug into other blue connections. So you really can't mess it up. Um, if we want to start the process of building a simple CTOK NG network, there's a couple of components we need. We need backbone, and this is what carries data down the length of the boat. We'll need a spur cable anytime we're going to connect a device to the network. And the spurs are color-coded white. They have a slightly different keying system on them. And again, they only plug in to other white connections on the network, so you can't get them crisscrossed. Another important component of CTOK NG is terminators. This is a CTOK NG terminator, and let me bring it up over here on our product cam so you can see it a little bit closer. So this is a CTOK NG terminator. It looks like just a little plastic plug, and you can see it's got some pins on it. What's actually inside this is there is a resistor. And this will plug in to blue sockets at the end of your CTOK NG network. So depending on how you've configured it, you may have something like this five-way device uh, in a very small network. Um, we might have a very long backbone with lots of cable pulled through the boat. And it might end with a T connector like this. But what you'll always find at each end of your network is a blue terminator plugged in. And they just plug right into the blue socket, and then it locks in place. There's always two terminators, 
there is never less than two, and there are never more than two terminators. So that's really important. We only want to have two terminators in the network, and that electrically defines the ends, the endpoints. All of our devices are going to connect up on white spurs. Our backbone in blue is going to carry data down the length of the boat. So what I have here on the table is actually a little networking accessory called a five-way connector. And a five-way connector all by itself is actually a very simple CTOK NG network. So you can see here I have backbone, which essentially runs through the connector itself. I have a blue on this end and a blue on this end. So if I take this five-way connector and I add a terminator here, and I add a terminator here, you can see here I've got a specialty cable. This is a red one. This is a power cable. You can kind of see the red stripe on it. There you go. So this actually feeds power into our network. I have two spurs for devices. So maybe I have an instrument, maybe I have an axiom multifunction display. So if I have power, I have spurs for devices, I have a terminator, a terminator, and I have a backbone that spans the length of this device, that is in itself a complete CTOK NG network, ready to pass information between the devices that are plugged into it. Now let's say I want to make this a little bit bigger. Maybe I've got a bigger boat, I've got instruments in more than one location. Well, it's really easy to expand this network, and that's one of the great things about it. I can actually pull this terminator out of the network. I just unlock it, oops, pull it out. Sometimes it gives me a little fight. Here we go, live television, that's what you get. And if I want to run down the length of the boat, I can bring into play a backbone cable. So this one is uh, probably three meters or five meters long. But all I have to do is plug my backbone cable in here. I stretch this out as far as I want to go down the end of the boat. When I get to the other end, I had add a T connector. Here's another specialty piece. The T connectors allow me to make a connection anywhere in the backbone. And then here I can plug in a spur cable to go to a device. And then out the other side, I could keep going with another length of backbone cable. Or I could say, yep, this is the end. I plug a terminator in, lock it in place. And that becomes now the end of my CTOK NG network. So you can see this one's actually a little bit bigger now. So I could go a considerable distance down the length of the boat. Now I want to pop back on to the diagram that we were just looking at. And I'm going to advance and show you my next diagram. So this one's a little more complicated, but don't get overwhelmed by this. So you can see in this diagram here, um, we have built a CTOK NG network using uh, a couple of five-way connectors. Right, so here's one of those five ways right here. Here's another five way connector. There's a T connector, a T connector, but notice at each end, I have a blue terminator to define this end. And I have a blue terminator here defining this end of the network. And in between, I've got some I-70 displays. I've got multifunction displays, some axioms. I see a smart transducer in there. Um, so it makes um, a very, very easy installation, and it's a, a quick and convenient way to run data down the length of the boat wherever you need it, and it's very easy to assemble because it snaps together, it locks together, it's waterproof, um, and it's keyed, so you can't actually mess up the connections. Now, a couple of other things that I want to point out here. <clears throat> when you start to build a CTOK NG network, it has the notion of something called LEN. And you'll see that referred to on this diagram. LEN is something called load equivalency number. And it's a big term, but it's actually pretty simple. What it actually is a measure of is how much power that item draws on the network. So every device that's going to be plugged into CTOK NG has a LEN number assigned to it. So you can see most MFDs are a, a value of one. Um, Instruments uh, have a value of three. Transducers will have a number. They have a one. And one of the things we try to do is we try to balance the power distribution. So we add up all the items that are to the left of our power input, and we add up all the items that are to the right of the power input. And we try to just have an equal lend value on both sides. And that basically makes sure that we don't, uh, we don't starve for power at one end of the network or the other. Um, it's, it's not as complicated as it sounds, so we do have it detailed in our documentation when you go to install this sort of stuff. But it's just something to keep in the back of your mind as you're planning your network. If you only have a handful of devices on board the boat, it's really not a big deal. 
um, it, it kind of balances itself out automatically. But on a very large boat, you might have multiple items in multiple locations. Uh, so uh, LEN is something to keep in mind if you're building a very, very big system. Um, I want to talk about a few other uh, connections that we have here. I'm going to uh, pop ahead and show you a device called a CTOK1 to CTOK NG converter. And this is what it looks like. Um, it looks similar to the five way block. So there's a five way block. There is the converter. Here, let me bring them up on the product cam so you can see them a little better. There's a five way block. It's this one here. I guess you can get a peek inside. You can see the pins inside. It's got twist lock connectors on it. So this is a special version of the five-way block, and this is a CTOK1 to CTOK NG converter. So this actually has an active circuit uh, in it, a little computer in here. There's actually an LED that lights up when this is powered up, um, and it'll kind of give you a status as to what's going on. But notice this one has some different color coding on it. We have uh, backbone connections on the ends. We have normal CTOK NG spur connectors. But this one in the middle, color-coded yellow, is reserved for a CTOK1 device. So maybe you're um, adding new equipment to an old boat, and you might have a CTOK first-generation autopilot. You might have some ST60 instruments, ST40 instruments, maybe even ST30 instruments. And you want to be able to tie that older gear into the newer navigation network. That's what this block allows you to do. So there is actually a special spur cable that plugs into this yellow fitting. So I'm going to bring it into play, plug it in. And what you'll notice on the end of it is it has, oops, there we go. It has the old school uh, three pin CTOK1 connector. So now I can plug into a CTOK1 network. I can take data from older instruments or displays um, and pass it through onto CTOK NG. And this is a bi-directional connection. So new data is bridged to the old network and old data is bridged to the new network. So it's a pretty cool way to add uh, you know, new tricks to an older boat. Uh, we can pop back onto the slideshow just for a second. Uh, I'm gonna show you, uh, here's an example of that device in use. So you can see I've got some ST60 series instruments, some analog transducers connected to them. And here they tie in to the new CTOK NG network and it'll pass that out to, uh, to an Axiom or to maybe some I-70s or an Evolution Autopilot, whatever you might have on the newer network. All that data shared. Um, I'm gonna pop ahead and just show you another application that is very common. A lot of people ask about this. Um, an Autopilot is a huge investment and you may not be eager to upgrade or change out an older Autopilot, especially if it's working well. Uh, well, you don't have to. Um, if you have a Raymarine CTOK1 autopilot, but maybe you want to upgrade to some Axiom MFDs or quantum radar and newer technology, you can leave the old pilot in the boat and through this CTOK1 to CTOK NG interface, you can tie them together. So here's that yellow connection. CTOK1 out here to the autopilot's old network. Here's the course computer. There's the controller. These are all CTOK1 devices and they get bridged onto the new network down here. So it's a very, very seamless and easy way uh, to bring different generations of product together. So I've got a few more accessories out here to show you. Um, CTOK NG is a CAN bus network. And a, you know, it is actually a very, very close uh, cousin to something called NMEA 2000. Um, that's a term you probably have heard if you follow marine electronics or boating at all. Uh, you may have seen stuff about it at the boat show. So the NMEA is the National Marine Electronics Association. They're actually the industry trade group that Marine Marine and all the other electronics manufacturers belong to. And they also set standards for marine electronic devices. So devices that are NMEA compliant have some level of uh, interoperability and the latest generation of their standard is called NMEA 2000. So our CTOK NG network is actually uh, NEMA 2000 running on our own waterproof cabling system. So anything that you can run over uh, CTOK NG, you can also run on NEMA 2000 and vice versa. There may be times when you wanna mix different products together. So maybe you have um, a whole bunch of Raymarine instruments and a Raymarine autopilot 
but you have somebody else's VHF radio and you need to get data to it via NEMA 2000. Well, it's actually as simple as using a uh, device net spur. And let me show you what that looks like. Uh, we'll bring it up on the product cam so you can see it up close. So this is a spur cable. And you can notice on one end, that is the CTOC NG waterproof connection. The other end of it has an NMEA 2000 device net connector. So here you could plug in to uh, a non Raymarine VHF or instrument or some other device, uh, and they will play uh, just fine and dandy together on the STNG network. Now we also make a version of this to go the other way too. And that one, where'd it go? Well, it's here somewhere. I'll find it in a moment. But anyway, this is the version of it with a male connector. We have it with a female connector as well. So if you have a Raymarine device and you want to drop it into somebody else's NEMA 2000 network, maybe Spiruno or Garmin or something like that, you can do that as well. Um, it is very, very easy to adapt them back and forth using those connectors. Not only can you adapt the spurs from a device uh, to work on a different network. You can also do that with Backbone uh, as well. This is a new accessory that we recently started making. Uh, a lot of installers uh, really like this device and it allows you to change the format of the Backbone between CTOC NG and DeviceNet. So you can see we've got different kind of connector on each end. It allows you to seamlessly go uh, from one to the other. Uh, there's a male version of it. There's a female version of it. So very easy to do. Um, I wanted to show you a little bit more um, about CTOC NG and just how it works on various types of devices. So in my hand, this is actually an AIS uh, receiver unit. It's a Raymarine AIS 350. Down here on the bottom, you can see it has a white CTOC NG connector. So in the olden days with AIS, if you wanted to hook one of these up to your system, uh, it was actually a pretty complicated connection. Um, most AIS receivers in their first generation used a, an older protocol called NEMA 0183, NMEA 0183, which was actually a four wire connection and it didn't have a standard plug on it and you'd have to get out heat shrink and solder and all sorts of stuff to, to tie them together. Um, so those connections were a challenge um, to get uh, installed properly and have them uh, be durable and reliable. Um, so one of the nice things that NEMA 2000 and CTOC NG does is it makes it just very easy uh, to plug in uh, to any device and plug it right into the network. So all I need is just a white spur cable. So I take my spur, plug it in right here to the bottom of my AIS, plug the other end uh, into an empty spur socket somewhere on my network, and I am connected data-wise. So very, very simple installation. One other accessory um, that's actually fairly important that I would like to point out. Uh, we've looked a couple times at these backbone connectors and let's bring this back up on the product cam again. A little bit closer look at it. So here is a five-way uh, connector. Again, we have spur connections, backbone connections. Here is an example of a T connector. Again, that allows me to create a drop to plug a device in. Um, and for that matter, even on my AIS, again, here's the, that CTOC NG socket. Well, anytime you have a cable plugged in, these are waterproof. But what we don't want to do is we don't want to leave any of these exposed to the elements. The salt uh, will get in here and it'll eat up these pins. Uh, so we make uh, blanking plugs. So this looks just like a terminator. Oops, there we go. Now you can see it. Uh, but notice it's black instead of blue. Uh, so this is actually not a terminator, it's a blanking plug. And if I tip it this way, you can see that there's actually no contacts in it, it's just holes. Um, but when this is plugged into any of these sockets, and this fits both into backbone and, and into spur connections, I lock it down, um, it's just a weather cap. So it's gonna keep, keep the crust and crud out of there, uh, keep the pins nice and clean so that when you do add an accessory down the road, it's ready to go. One other note about these five-way connectors, 
whenever you're installing them, um, it is a good idea to turn them upside down and screw them into the overhead or um, oops, upside down um, or sideways. And that is to allow water to not collect in them. In the event that you forget to put a weather cap in it, um, or uh, it ends up submerged for some reason or another. We want the water to be able to drain out of these things. Um, so it is a good idea to put them in sideways uh, or inverted, have your cables come in from the bottom uh, so that they do drain out properly. All right, so um, the next topic we're gonna talk about is Raynet. And Raynet is Raymarine's high speed Ethernet system. I'm just going to move this out of the way, that down there. So Raynet is used to connect devices together that are high bandwidth devices. So things like your multifunction displays, uh, your sonar, your radar. If you have a FLIR thermal camera or other visible cameras, um, they all connect together using Raynet. And uh, these are some Raynet parts on the table in front of me here. And what Raynet is, is it is actually high speed ethernet with a waterproof connector system on it. So at home, you probably have cat five and cat six cables maybe pulled through the walls of your house or in your office. And they connect together with um, this telephone looking connector. It's called an RJ45 and we'll put it on the product cam so you can see what it looks like. So that is an RJ45 connector. And these are great for indoor applications where they are not exposed to the weather, uh, but out on a boat in the open in salt air, uh, one of these RJ45 connectors will probably die after a couple of weeks. So we prefer to use a watertight connection like this. So this is Raymarine's marinized version of an ethernet cable called Raynet. And we offer these cables in a bunch of different configurations. Um, so this particular one that's in my hand, let me put it down here so you can see it a little better, actually has Raynet on one end and RJ45 on the other. Now the advantage is this is a little bit smaller, so this can be easier to pull through um, tubing and uh, through tight spaces on a boat. Um, these RJ45 uh, ends are also field installable. So if you had to make this really, really small, uh, someone with the knowledge to do a, a field installation of one of these, and they're not too difficult to do, could actually cut this off, uh, fish it through a very tight um, opening uh, down a cable way or down some tubing, and then they could just reattach a connector on the other end. Now, to get this back to a waterproof configuration, we do have some different accessories uh, to support that. Uh, one of these is this guy right here. This is kind of a cool accessory. So this actually has a watertight RJ45 connector on this end. Let me unscrew it. You can see down inside in the belly of the beast there, you can see you can plug in an RJ45 cable, uh, but it comes with this very, very nice uh, uh, seal and cable gland uh, so that when it's all screwed together and assembled, um, we could put a field installable connector on the end of this wire. You know, we slip this on, uh, put our connector on, and then it all screws together and it is 100% watertight uh, when this is all put together. And then it turns it back into a Raynet connector on this end, uh, so it can plug right into a device. More commonly, we'll see Raynet connectors like this, where it just has the standard Raynet female on both ends. And we have these in different lengths, anywhere from 400 millimeters up to 20 meters in length. So these can go uh, pretty far distances. Um, one of the things that's really cool about Raynet is not only does it carry high bandwidth information, it also carries all of your CTOC NG and NEMA 2000 information. So let's say, for example, you had a boat with a flybridge, or you had a sailboat, and you had instruments out um, in the cockpit, and you had instruments down below. Well, you could pull cables for all your different systems through the boat and have both uh, CTOC NG and Raynet run out to those remote stations, but you don't have to. Um, you can actually run the uh, CTOC NG just as far as kind of whatever, whatever is going to be the master display on the boat. And from there, you just run the basic uh, high speed Ethernet cables out. Um, because whatever device 
um, is the, the master is actually going to bridge the data together. So all this, all the NEMA 2000 and CTOK NG data will end up on the fast Ethernet, and it'll travel down the wire along with your radar and sonar and camera feeds and everything else. So there's a lot of extra bandwidth there uh, to support that. Um, let me show you a diagram of what a basic uh, Raynet fast Ethernet system looks like. And here's a pretty simple setup. Uh, we have, number one, is a device called a network switch. That is an HS5 five-port uh, Ethernet switch. So again, similar to a switch like you might have at home or in your office, you know, that connects your a couple of laptops and your printer together. Um, the main difference here is this one is waterproof and it is designed to run off of 12 volts DC in a marine environment, so it's ruggedized. But uh, emanating out from that switch, we can connect in our different peripherals. Here we've got a FLIR thermal camera, we've got a radar, and we've got a multifunction display. So this is just a good example of a very basic setup. And we could expand that out to a bigger system. And one of the things we can do to create more network ports if we need it is we can gang together multiple HS5 network switches. So each switch has five ports on it, and port number five, which is the one all the way out on the right, is actually a gigabit speed port. So we can use that port to link to another switch, and that helps to maintain the network speed. So here you can see we've got two network switches supporting a pretty big selection of devices. Here we've got a, uh, looks like a CP370 sonar module, a thermal camera, a radar. We have a couple of multifunction displays. We have a Sirius XM weather receiver. These are all high bandwidth ethernet devices connected to our switches. Um, but the nice thing about connecting it up this way is it is all high speed data. It is very simple to connect. Everything is waterproof, everything locks in place. So you're not gonna have problems with things vibrating loose or getting wet or anything like that. Um, a couple of specialty devices here I'm gonna show you um, on the product cam again. Let me flip back over to that. So here is a close-up of that HS5 network switch. Uh, this is one of the latest generation ones. Um, we can tell because it is black. Um, if you have some of these on your boat already and they're from a couple years ago, they might be gray, but it is the same device. We just changed the colors of them in the last uh, year or so. Um, but here's the front of the switch. These are actually LED uh, indicators. So kind of like uh, a network switch you might have at home or in your office. Uh, when these are dark, that means there's no activity on them. Uh, when you plug a device in, uh, they will turn green and they will flash to indicate actually the speed of the traffic that's flowing over them. Uh, and these uh, support 10, 100, and then port five supports a gigabit uh, for linking together multiple switches. And the, they'll blink uh, according to what speed the device is that's plugged into them. On the bottom side of it, here is a power cable, the power input for this. So it is 12 volt DC powered. Uh, designed to work on board your boat. It is a waterproof uh, power connector. And just coincidentally, it actually shares the cable uh, with the SeaTalk NG network. So it uses a, uh, a SeaTalk NG power cable. So you do not want to power the network switch from your STNG network. It does need its own feed down to 12 volts. And then here's our network ports to which we will connect our displays, our MFDs, and this has weather covers built in, so if there's ports that you're not using, definitely keep them covered up, and that keeps the salt air out of them, keeps the contacts nice and clean. The other thing you'll notice about these uh, is that they are keyed, so you have to get the cable in the right way, uh, but that keying uh, prevents you from plugging it in the wrong way uh, or damaging the pins in there uh, as well. So it is a pretty rugged device, and it's pretty compact too. It fits just about anywhere, um, you know, in your uh, helm console or in a locker. Um, put it in a kind of a centralized location, run all your devices to it. Another special one I'm going to show you here, this is called a PoE injector. And PoE stands for Power Over Ethernet. Some devices, um, and a good example of them are some FLIR cameras, and some of Ray Marine's augmented reality uh, cameras, the, the Marine Cam 210 and Cam 220 IP, or what they call PoE devices, power over ethernet. And those cameras have the ability to be powered by the network cable that is feeding to them. So this is a PoE injector. And what this does is it connects on this end uh, to um, a power source on board the, board the boat. In this case, anything between nine and 36 volts, it can accept here. 
and then we can connect a, um, uh, a cable back to the nearest network switch or network port. And then the other end of it here uh, feeds out to the camera or PoE capable device. And coming out this end of the wire is not only the data connection, uh, but also uh, voltage to actually power up uh, that camera. Uh, and a good example of that is, uh, for example, like a CAM uh, 220 uh, camera that you might use on our augmented reality system. They're PoE capable, so we'll often use a PoE injector to power them uh, if we don't have an alternative power source. Now, you might ask, what could that other power source be? Um, our Axiom XL multifunction displays, those are the biggest ones in our lineup, uh, those actually have power over Ethernet ports on them. So their standard network ports can actually power up uh, some of these cameras and other devices without the need for this uh, injector device. But this accessory is available for installations that might need it. All right, so um, I wanted to talk just for a moment about Bluetooth and Wi-Fi capability. So every Raymarine MFD currently in our lineup, right from Element through Axiom, Axiom Plus, Axiom Pro, Axiom XL, they support two different wireless networking protocols. Um, so they all have Wi-Fi and they all have Bluetooth. Um, but then you might ask, well, what do we use those protocols for? Uh, well, Wi-Fi is most commonly used uh, on our systems and you can do a couple of different things with that. Uh, number one, if you wanted to add an accessory like a quantum radar, like I've got over my shoulder here, a quantum radar has the ability to be wired or wireless in its connection to your boat's network. So if you choose to do the wireless configuration, uh, there is actually a Wi-Fi radio inside the quantum radar, and there is a Wi-Fi access point inside every Raymarine element and every Raymarine Axiom multifunction display. So we can do a wireless link uh, to the quantum, and that makes it very simple to install. Um, the, the radar does still need power run to it, but the power cable is actually very, very small, very thin, similar in, in uh, thickness to this guy right here. Um, so you can very easily snake that through tight locations or conveniently get power up on your hard top where you might already have power for navigation lights or spotlight or other things like that. Uh, but the Wi-Fi takes care of the data link and it's, it's secure. Uh, it's highly, highly uh, reliable um, and the range on it is fantastic as well. So it's definitely something to check out if you're considering adding a quantum or a quantum two uh, radar to your boat. Another thing we can do with the Wi-Fi is uh, we can remote control and remote view uh, any of the Axiom Lighthouse 3 multifunction displays. We have a couple of apps in our um, uh, in the uh, Apple iTunes and uh, Android stores uh, called Ray Connect, and Ray Remote. I'm sorry, yeah, Ray Connect, Ray Remote, and Ray Viewer. Um, and those apps um, can allow you to view or even remote control your MFD from a device like uh, an iPad or an Android tablet or to uh, remote control from your phone. Um, those apps are free. Um, they're in their uh, respective device stores. Um, so you can search them out by Raymarine um, and they, uh, they do come in handy. You, know, you can roam around the boat, see what's happening back at the helm. Um, if you have the tablet versions of them, the tablet actually offers full touch control of your Axiom. So anything you could normally touch on your Axiom display, you can touch on the tablet. Another capability that is uh, just getting started is um, the ability to sync maps over wireless. Um, you may have seen us make uh, some announcements about our Lighthouse charts that are coming soon. Uh, Lighthouse charts are supported by an app called RayConnect that is also now in the online chart stores. And uh, using the RayConnect app, you can actually uh, download charts to your mobile device and then transfer them into your Axiom or Element system. You can download updates to your charts. You can add or remove satellite photos and premium points of interest. Uh, so it's a pretty cool capability. Another thing you, you're going to be able to do with that app is you can actually take those Lighthouse charts and load them to the internal memory on your Axiom. Uh, we'll have some more about Lighthouse charts in North America coming out in the next couple of weeks. 
Um, if you uh, um, have been following raymarine.com, you'll see that um, in Europe, the Lighthouse charts have actually already launched in a few key areas. So if you're in the UK or France or Italy or Portugal, uh, some of those titles are, are already available and North America ones are coming very shortly for the start of boating season. So definitely stay tuned for more information on that. Uh, finally, I wanted to talk about Bluetooth capabilities. So we have Bluetooth in Element and we have Bluetooth in Axiom displays. Uh, currently in Element, the Bluetooth is reserved for future expansion. It doesn't do anything yet, but the radio is there and we do have plans for it. And you'll learn about that soon. In Axiom, uh, its Bluetooth capability can be used for a couple things. You can actually stream Bluetooth audio from your Axiom out to a speaker or a stereo system on board your boat. So you may remember like Axiom has Lighthouse apps and one of those apps is Netflix and another one is Spotify. You can actually run Netflix on your Axiom and send the sound to a Bluetooth speaker or the Bluetooth channel on your boat's audio system. So that's kind of a cool way that you can use it. Uh, we also have a remote control that mounts to a steering wheel that can work through that. And uh, you can repeat alarms over Bluetooth as well to your audio system. So there's some cool capabilities uh, with all that networking that is built into uh, Axiom. All right, um, let's take a look at a few of the comments and we'll, we'll take a few questions uh, here tonight. And uh, one of the things I will be doing tomorrow too is following up on anything that we can't take live. Um, like I said, we've got a ton of uh, comments in there. So we'll kind of pick a few out. Um, but if we don't take your comment uh, tonight, uh, please don't feel bad, but I will get back to you tomorrow with an answer. Um, I'll spend probably most of the day answering uh, comments. So here's a great question from John Leahy. Um, how critical is the balancing? So um, I think he's referring to the LEN numbers. I, I talked about in CTOC NG, the load equivalency, equivalency numbers. Um, how critical is the balancing? Well, it is important, John. Um, it only becomes a big factor when you have a very, very long network that is uh, physical length. Uh, of the, your backbone, and you have lots of devices on it because the way that the CTOC NG network is generally fed, it's fed from a single point. Uh, so you try to inject the power into the middle of mathematically where the center of it is. So you kind of look at all your devices and their LEN numbers and where they are on the boat, and you'd like to kind of find the middle. So you add up all the LEN numbers on this end of the boat, add up all the LEN numbers on this end of the boat and divide by two and kind of where, wherever in the line you can get to the middle point, that's where you want to inject the power into it. So that's when it becomes important. If you have a small system, uh, we're talking you know, maybe six devices or less, it, it becomes less, less critical. Um, it's the cables are shorter, um, the power does not drop off over the length of the, the cabling um, uh, as quickly. Um, so it's something to keep in mind, but it's not, not quite as critical. Uh, another great question here, this is from Eric. He wants to know if there's a maximum number of spurs the system can handle. Uh, there is a maximum number. Um, it's a pretty big number. So in reality, um, you're probably not gonna encounter it. I believe it's up in the hundreds, uh, but it has something to do with the network architecture and just how many channels it can actually address. Um, but more importantly, there are actually some limitations to the length of the spurs. Um, our CTOC NG devices are actually supplied with an installation guide that goes into all the details on how long your spurs can be. And the length of the spurs uh, can vary depending on uh, how much load the item on the end of that spur draws. So I'm gonna refer, have you refer to that when you go to install a device, but it is something to keep in mind that there is a limit to the number of spurs. You probably won't hit the physical number of spur limit, uh, but the length of the spurs um, is a factor that you'll wanna watch out for. And question from Bob Baxter. He says, only 100 megabit connections. Uh, yes. So on our HS5 network switch, um, basically the first four ports are 100 megabit connections. The fifth port has gigabit support on it, but that's used primarily for linking multiple switches together to maintain the network speed. Um, the data that we're actually transporting across the network uh, actually travels quite nicely at 100 megabit speed or less. Um, so we don't really have the need to go to gigabit just yet, but um, many of our devices are actually gigabit capable already. Um, so they are ready when they do need to, to pop up uh, to that. Uh, but the switches uh, themselves right now, they are 100 megabit switches with gigabit on port five uh, for linking more than one together. 
And I think we got time for a couple more questions. Let's see what we got here. Ah, from Garrett. Uh, Garrett would like to know, is there any vessel information for mercury engines on axiom units? Um, that is a great question, Garrett. We get that a lot uh, from customers all over the world because obviously mercury is one of the larger engine brands uh, out there, especially here in North America, but, but worldwide as well. So yes, if you want to get engine data from mercury up onto an axiom, it is possible to do that. Um, they, mercury uses a system called Vessel View, and their Vessel View displays do have standard NEMA 2000 outputs on them. So we can actually bridge from a vessel view, dis vessel view display into the CPOC NG network using uh, one of these uh, spur cables with a device net adapter on it, plug in, and it'll populate the data page uh, on Axiom uh, with data from your Mercury engine. So you'll get all the basic stuff. You'll get you know, RPMs and fuel levels and um, some basic engine alarms and um, temperatures and pressures and all that sort of stuff. And the display on Axiom can be configured uh, whether you have single, dual, triples, quads, um, we support multiple different engine configurations on there. Uh, we also have engine integration for Yamaha, uh, for Volvo, for Honda. Um, most engine manufacturers nowadays support NEMA 2000 uh, networking in one form or another. Um, so if your engine has that NEMA 2000 N2K capability, um, we can most likely display it on Axiom. And a question from Lewis, does Lighthouse 3 have full backward compatibility yet? Um, so backward compatibility, um, we had spent some time issuing um, a bunch of different uh, updates, uh, quarterly updates for Lighthouse 3. Um, right now, our latest out there is Lighthouse 3 um, Edgar Town, um, version 3.13. And with every release of Lighthouse 3, we have been adding not only new features, but we have been adding uh, some legacy features that had been in our Lighthouse 2 products uh, that customers were looking for. Uh, at this point in time, we do pretty much have full uh, compatibility um, with uh, what we had in the Lighthouse 2 lineup. There might be a couple of very minor features that haven't made it through yet, but I think for the most part, everything uh, is in there. In terms of running Lighthouse 3 on older hardware, um, Lighthouse 3 is supported on our ES and GS series products only. So those can be converted from Lighthouse 2 to Lighthouse 3. Um, the other prior generations of Lighthouse 2 hardware uh, don't have quite enough memory and processor power to run Lighthouse 3. From Bob, I have a circa 2003 system on my boat, C80, et cetera. Will these newer networks tie into them at all so I can migrate to newer tech more slowly? Uh, Bob, yes and no. So with a device like a C80, um, you do have on that uh, a, connector, a connector for CTOC2, which was kind of an early version of CTOC NG. So we do have some compatibility there. Um, you can go between these connections and a CTOC2 connector on your C80, I believe. Um, you also have a CTOC1 connector on there too. So you could definitely use uh, this device, the CTOC1 to CTOC NG converter, uh, to go back and forth between the old network and the new network. Um, another consideration with a C80 display as you start down the upgrade path, a lot of people will ask about the radar. Um, if you invested in a radar for your C80, that radar will only work with your C80. Um, C80s use an analog radar connection. So your radar plugs directly to your screen. So when you do decide down the road that you're going to start upgrading your MFD, um, your radar would get swapped out at the same time for a digital radar, something like a Quantum or a Magnum. And a question from Nathan. Beta Marine Engine Data Support on Axiom. Uh, that's a good question, Nathan. I'm going to have to look into that one and get back to you. Um, if they have the ability to output NEMA 2000 information, which most engine manufacturers do now, then we should be able to display it. Uh, that's not one that I'm familiar with off the top of my head, so I would need to double check that they have that capability. I think we've got time probably for one more question before we sign off tonight. 
Ah, Robert wants to know, where will we post responses tomorrow? Uh, great question, Robert, and it's actually a good, a good question to sign off with. Uh, so um, your comments um, are basically uh, in Facebook or YouTube, whatever platform it is that you're watching on right now. So we will actually answer them all right there. Um, and if you're on one platform and want to see what the people on the other platform ask, uh, you can just simply pop onto the Raymarine channel on either social media platform. You'll be able to see all the comments and questions and answers. Um, the other thing you'll be able to do is you'll be able to watch the replay of it. Um, the video will be available um, probably right after we disconnect tonight, shortly thereafter. Um, do feel free to share that as well. If you found this helpful and informative, I uh, would strongly encourage you to share that with your, uh, your friends and, and family. Um, another thing, uh, if you want to be notified um, whenever we do go live, um, please remember to like our, and, or subscribe to our channels. And uh, that'll make sure that you don't miss any of our Raymarine Live content. We are going to be um, doing these broadcasts on Thursday nights, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, right here on YouTube and Facebook. And um, I do read all of your comments. Uh, I love to get the feedback on what you think of the broadcast, what worked, what didn't work. Tell us what you want to see in the future, what you want to learn about. I will tailor the broadcasts to, uh, to get you the information that you want to know. So I think we're going to sign off for tonight. I really want to thank you all again for joining us and coming out to learn all about networking. I hope we uh, took away some of the mysteries of that. Uh, we will be back next Thursday with our next installment of Raymarine Live. I hope to see you there then. Good night and thank you.